Just for uh, reiteration, my name is Josh uh, with the Adaptive Team. And Jeff here, you know, is an Adaptive National Team uh, Manager and Coach and Team Member. Um, tell you what, I'm really excited that you guys put in the week that you did here too. And I think about that we've been at this for five days straight. And you've got all these beautiful sunny days and afternoons. It's a nice, last nice day and everybody shows up still to get more education and information um, about Adaptive. It's, it really shows the dedication of this group and where where we're going. You know, from previous inner skis and the dedication, I said that, you know, this morning at our, at our uh, event. And this was really nice to see this number of people continue to, to show up day after day after day to put this in towards Adaptive. It really shows the professionalism that's out there and, like I said, the dedication that, that we're seeing in the amazement. So I know that's going to be inner ski after inner ski from now on. I think it's going to be a bigger and bigger group every year. So, um, yeah, keep doing what you guys are doing at home because it's pretty amazing. So, yeah, we're here to talk today about our, our Adaptive Alpine Manual. Um, and we say Adaptive Alpine Manual because it really is um, teaching Alpine skiing. That's something we hold true um, within the United States. That's part of our message and our and our mission is to be able to really integrate the two to show that skiing is skiing and snowboarding is snowboarding. It doesn't matter what you ride on, that we're using the same fundamentals. We hear that message over and over and over again, and I love that we've been hearing that all week long. It's a pretty incredible message. Um, it gives me great hope for the way things are going to be progressing when it comes to education, um, especially when it comes to teaching people with disabilities. I know that I wouldn't be where I am in, in the sport if there wasn't that focus behind it. It would have been very easy to slapped a tether on me and giving me a ride and taking me somewhere, but what I really developed as a skier and as an athlete, if um, I didn't have those behind me who pushed for those type of skills and didn't say that, well, you can't do that right now, but let's figure a way to make it happen. So that's a big part of this manual and, you know, our focus and sort of what the U.S. tries to portray in all of our manuals and all of our educational materials. Really important to us. Cool. Jeff just reiterated, uh, I'll say once again that skiing is skiing. We as a team get together uh, and we have a four year term with our team and so you look at it as a, as a four year project each time that we get together and what, are, what is our message of this team from the 2016 to 2020 team and we really are pushing the fact that, that skiing is skiing and that snowboarding is snowboarding. It sounds very, very simple in, in, in saying it. Uh, and it is, uh, but it's not that simple once you get out on the hill. And when people have that perception of looking at adaptive equipment and the students, and then all of a sudden they become equipment focused or instructor focused, uh, and that, that's that, that's not the case. So we're looking at uh, as skiing is skiing and snowboarding is snowboarding. So our five fundamentals, it doesn't matter uh, whatever the tool it is that you're using, uh, if it's skiing, it's skiing. And then you look at our body movements and our board performances on the snowboard side. And it doesn't matter if you're on a snowboard, the body can move and the board performs. And so it holds true to whatever tool that we're uh, using then as well. Uh, we in the U.S. are very student-centered and we do look at uh, outcome base. So what is it that our students want to get out of their lesson? Uh, what do they want to get short-term goals? What do they want to get long-term goals? And how can we help facilitate rather than dictate. We want to be able to facilitate their learning experience and we build up the learner rather than just talking down as an instructor. To them. Uh, so of course our new manual that just came out uh, does mostly go towards the Alpine side uh, but it is going with all of that concept with that, with that, uh, with that thought process. So you look at not just our manual, but all of our other material, uh, it's, it supports that. It's student-centered, it's uh, student goals-oriented, outcome-based, and uh, related to our fundamentals, both in the skiing world and in the snowboarding world. So that was a major shift, I would say, in the last, well, eight years, 10 years, uh, even 20, 30 years ago, and, and he has some history behind me, explain some. Uh, on our next slide is we really are moving and in the adaptive world shifting away from being so centric around what equipment do you need and what can I do for you as an instructor versus 
what do you want to do out on the hill and how can we accomplish that and get you to do that as the student? Yeah. And you know when Josh was talking about student centered, that's that is really our basis. And as instructors, we believe that it's our duty to actually tell the student or the families in many cases what's possible. Because when people come to us, they've they've maybe watched something on YouTube and they've seen somebody having being tethered down the mountain and they didn't envision that as sort of a ride. Maybe that's the only thing they envision adaptive skiing to be. We're there to actually show them what is possible. You know, it's very easy to give somebody that experience, sure, but we really need to, you know, as adaptive instructors, be able to let them know all of the avenues that they could actually explore. Because one of the things that I've found over the years in, in trying to stay student-centered is that they don't know what they don't know until I'm actually able to tell them the equipment and opportunities that are out there for them because they don't realize that some of these things are even possible. I mean, I, I think about myself as a sit skier. Every day I'm so lucky. How can I be, as the way I wheel around, you know, through muddy parking lots here in Bulgaria and, you know, through slushy snow and it's very difficult to get around. When I get in my sit ski, I'm the freest man in the world. You know, so it's, people don't realize that that tool allows such freedom and expression, you know, until we really let them know that that's possible. So that's an important part. Sometimes they don't know what they don't know. I also want to pass this out while you guys are looking at the adaptive manual that we passed out there because this Alpine manual is the partner to it. In fact, you know, in the United States, we, we talk about it all the time that I wouldn't, I almost don't want any adaptive instructor to be able to purchase our adaptive manual without that. And really they shouldn't. Because if you don't understand that, you won't be able to understand what's going on in, the, in our manual. And that's, that's a piece to it. So I wanted to talk about where our manual came from, where, you know, kind of the, the struggles that we went through, you know, early on, and, you know, how we came together, you know, in working with our other disciplines to get to an amazing place of not only integration, but a, a common message using all the fundamentals and commonality in a one-team approach when it comes to all our educational material. When we say we're one team, you know, PSIA has our Alpine, our, you know, our Nordic Telemark, snowboard, adaptive, and everybody's together, we train together, and we explore concepts together. That's our one team approach. That's kind of a, a, a unique thing, we think, and we're starting to see more and more teams explore that, I think, throughout the, the world as well. So, our earliest manuals, when I think back to what they, they really involved, anybody remember one called Bolt Tracks? Mm -hmm. Hamill Leary? Yeah, exactly. You know, great guy, and that was a really cool manual. And it, the thing is, that one held true for so many years after it was in print. It's not in print anymore. If you can get a hold of it, sometimes you can find it on Amazon or something like that from time to time. But it's a, it's a nice piece of history to have. And it had, and it's still a lot of the points within it are valid. But within it, it was very equipment-based. Um, it was really in the, the early, especially when it came to um, the sit equipment and the interaction with that. You gotta think about how many much things have changed. We've gone in the last 20 years from straight skis that needed to be pushed and shoved around, and really there was a lot more outrigger steering interaction than we could use the body sometimes just because of the tool that was underneath us. And we didn't we weren't able to use as much rotary and steering. We had to do a lot of pushing and shoving and just powering through. Um, you know, so things have changed a lot um, in regards to that. Our earliest manuals really were equipment based. They were, they were trying to create uh, an idea of how to be safe with the equipment, how to set it up, um, how to fit it to someone. And that was kind of it. Then it was almost like, and I remember it even myself in my first lessons, because of the, there wasn't the information out there. It was sort of, okay, it was a get out there and learn with your instructor. And it was definitely a guided discovery type of attempt. So I've been in a sit ski now 23 years. And I don't know how long many of you have taught or been involved in it. But 23 years ago, it was, we lost a lot of good men along the way. There were a lot of people that got frustrated um, because the instruction wasn't what it could have been. And, and it's not because the instructors didn't care. They didn't know what to teach. They just knew that they had a ski, they could put somebody on it, and it was like, let's go. It's kind of like teaching your friends how to ski. You know, a lot of people that just go out with their friend who quote unquote says they're an instructor, they know how to ski, but they don't really. But that's what I remember way back when I first started, there was a lot of that kind of fit and feel to a lesson. There was a lot of exploration and like, what if we try this and do this? But, you know, we've, we've become a lot better than that now. 
we've, we're really dialing into what skiing is and the way the equipment interacts with the body, using the pilot, not thinking that the equipment's going to ski us, but the actual person is the pilot behind us. And if you can explore what body parts function are connected and they can turn against each other and create tension between muscle groups, that's where we've evolved and that's where we've become so much better. So our older manuals, as you can see, not right now, but now you can see, hey, it's magic. Uh, you know, like you said, it was mainly uh, equipment focused and uh, disability focused. It's almost like reading a text manual from a uh, doctorate. And then also, uh, we didn't really have the, the scheme focus. It was, it was mostly on the disability of the equipment. or losing the, the skier from the previous manuals. Right. Yeah, it was, you guys remember a lot of the, the medical references at that time would have, would have been real basic, right? Or they told you to refer to, in, in our country, it's called a PDR, or Physician's Desk Reference. Anybody ever try to read one of those? Yeah. It's the worst thing you'll ever try to navigate through in your life. It's about that thick. You know, about the new manual, and half the language you can't even understand. Well, it's, going, it's very difficult to even find the diagnoses that you're dealing with. But now we have so many great materials that are starting to come out that actually relate to everything about what you might experience while skiing, while you're out on the hill. Relationship with the materials even that we're using between the duct tape and the foam cushions and things like that that might react to to skin or to somebody that has a latex allergy. So we're a lot more dialed into the equipment that we have and the way it can actually react with a person and their specific diagnosis, which that's a really cool evolution. And so now with the new manual, uh, we're in a new era of adaptive skiing. So some of the cool points about the new manual there, Jeff. Yeah, so one of the things as um, you guys now have access to it, you know, we have that QR code that we passed out. Um, to everyone. Hopefully everybody can get a hold of that and is able to download it. I know some of you tried it a little earlier on here, sometimes with the internet connection. People got like halfway through it and just seemed to bog down. All of us had that, that trouble, it seems like. It, um, I mean, it is a large manual too as well, so it does require a lot of data at the same time. So we think that this must have simplified it at this point. So that's why we changed kind of the process while we're here, so it made it a little bit easier for you guys. Um, but one of the things that you're going to find great about this this new manual and that we're really proud of are it's just sort of a, its general approach. We're in a in a time where this manual explains the how, what, and why instead of just saying, "Here's the ski, here's how you set it up, here's how you go." It's all about if you see this happen, you can do this. If you see um, this is how you create rotary from this specific piece of equipment, how you can get to edge, how you adjust things, how you modify. Um, how you load onto a chairlift, how you get up from a, a sit ski. It goes through all the little nuances that people always ask questions about, right? And that students would have questions about. And the other amazing thing about it is that we try to really make it interactive. So more than it just being that you read through blah, 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 tons of text all the time, we've created um, QR codes within it that relate so that as you've read through a section or you've read the text, you're actually going to be able to go onto this QR code and then find out, actually actually see it, get a little bit more of a, an interaction with it, and be able to like analyze it over and over again. So that, you know, it's great for when you're training your instructors because they can see it. Not everybody has somebody who has a visual impairment around to watch how they guide and, and the interaction between that, that uh, instructor and that guest and the different terms that they're using. Not everybody has, you know, a, a sit skier who's proficient enough to be able to show them how to load in their program. So to be able to see that and watch that in video sometime. And, the, and because it's web-based, it's very simple. So a lot of people are using these um, links and they're YouTube-based in their training. So once you know it, you can take that, that clip and then use it and send, you can send out your group. You know, this week we're working on, um, you know, dynamic turns and assist people. This is the one I've seen from the manual. So we'll send that out as an example. And you can see how does that relate to, you can really build some great training modules based upon these YouTube um, QR code links. So if those refer back to, we have also a giant video bank that's larger because you can only put so many QR codes into a manual because once it, it starts to become very expensive. But it's also a draw into once you're in um, that area, we have a matrix that we call, and it's a list of all adaptive videos, all different types, and we have them divided up by you know three track, four track, mono, bi, visual impairments, and 
cognitive or intellectual disabilities. So we have a lot of ways to really interact well outside of just having to read the boring text manual sometimes. It's nice to be able to have that, but a lot of people these days, especially our younger instructors and, and even our students like to be able to see something like that. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of the QR codes. Josh is going to click on a couple of links. I'm just going to show you two examples of them, kind of the way that they run. Has so anybody else experimented with that in their own maybe QR codes, or what are you using as a, a right. platform or basis for it? Um, we, we started looking at that, yeah. I was just kind of asking around the, the cost of producing something like that. With the QR codes? Yeah. Well, I don't know, maybe Sue could maybe even speak to that a little bit more behind the camera there. But there was, uh, I know that when we were putting together the manual, we, want, cause our, we wanted a lot more QR codes than the Alpine manual. It because we have so many different ways to show things, right? You know, they're showing pretty much basic this type of turn, this type of turn, and that, but all of a sudden we were like, oh wow, we can show this, we can show that. And we wanted to do that for every single discipline. And that was one of the difficulties, even yeah. in putting this manual together. So exactly. if you see that our last manual was out in 2003, so it's 15 years later. And I'll tell you what, it was a, a bad one. I don't know anybody that's, it, you're probably doing, some of you guys are doing manuals for the first time. Um, I would never take on the project, and if you do it again, take it on one subject at a time. <laughs> to try to do all of those VIDD, three track, four track, mono buy, and have a really detailed description and how to really work through it and put it at the level that we wanted was difficult. You know, all the different writers and authors and people we had to get involved in around the country. Mm -hmm. So we wanted a lot of opinions, you know, so that we came up with a, a pretty solid um, direction of where we were going. There's a lot of information out there. And you want to, you can't even write it all down, and that's one reason we like the video platform because we can always continue to add on extra pieces and or supplements to it. And that's also why our manual is digital as well. So when you purchase it, you have um, an option. I think it's five dollars more right now to also buy the digital package, so that you've got it on your computer forever. 
So, you know, it makes it easier to take a segment out of it to be able to use for a demonstration or something that you're doing for your training. So, and a lot of people like to use it that way. Yeah, it's really quick and easy, and it's nice to be able to just show that, you know, show an example from it. And it's, it's something that we've uh, really enjoyed, and I know our membership loves it. They've been really excited about being able to use those clips, because finally they have something that's concrete to show what they can train towards. Because, you know, it is, it's, it's somewhat loose when you read it, right? For you to actually be able to see it. We've had the same advantage in our outline manuals now, too. So there are all those videos that are showing what the demos look like and at what levels, you know, like if you're training for level one, what it looks like, what it looks like at level two, and what it looks like at level three. You know, we haven't gotten to that point within the disability aspect. We're just trying to show good, solid fundamentals. Um, and that's what mostly our membership is looking for. So, you know, this isn't about trying to create the, uh, the next Paralympic athlete, and it's about, you know, like high edge angles and being um, as angulated as you can in a lot of our descriptors in this. That's a whole other aspect of this. What our membership and what most of our instructors wanted is to be able to create a great solid foundation to which, from which to move up. So in our materials at this point and a lot of the QR codes and videos that are there, it's more of a up through basic parallel. And there's a couple in there that get more advanced because those are the fun teasers that show that. But for the most part, it's really about establishing a, a foundation to create safety, good um, solid fundamental movements and patterns in our students and that's what our instructors were really asking for because it, did, it wasn't helpful for them to go out and ski with a high-end mono skier all around the mountain because most of the ones that they were having trouble with or trying to get going were from you know magic carpet up mm -hmm. out there on the working it hard on the, the beginner slopes that's that's where they they needed that little push to make sure that they were successful because the other part they could always fix. And once they were skiing, they knew they had a happy student. So we built it more from the bottom up, where I know uh, one of the mistakes that came along um, in the process of manuals, our Alpine team at first when they were building the, ma the matrix, they did it, it was all high end, you know, it was like, because that was fun, right? And that's what some of the membership wanted that. But really, most of the lessons that we all teach, let's face it, they're not all up on the top of the slope, right? And so, what we, what we try to produce after learning from their mistakes is that, well, we're going to build ours from the bottom up because I knew that's what our membership really wanted. So that's one of the directions that we took with it. Yeah. Any questions at all so far? Yeah. I know that most of us have all been in a, a group together for the last five days. Uh, just for your reiteration, uh, let me get back on the slide. So thank you very much. I'm trying to pull up those. There you go. Uh, just for your own, if you haven't seen them yet, we talked about them earlier this week, earlier this morning. Uh, the five fundamentals on the, on the skiing side, a uh, whole true. We went through a lot of the progressions of what we want to be able to teach to a sit down uh, skier this morning, and then how each one of those uh, still relied on the five fundamentals. He was managing pressure from the tip of the ski to the tail of the ski, so along the, along the length of the ski, uh, controlling pressure from ski to ski. Always another way to enable one of those fundamentals to get the same outcome. So the focus for us is always snow-based, what's happening at that level, and then we can start to work on up the body. That's always one of the ways that we've worked it to be able to make sure that all of these fundamentals hold true that we're able to do this in any capacity with, uh, within any of the, the disability groups, so whether it's sit down or stand up. So it, there's always one of those elements that's, that holds true. And you need to bring them all together. That was the other important piece too, is that no one of them, we explored that a little bit today on the hill, is that you can't just have one without all the others. It's, it's when you say it's a fundamental, it's the combination of you know, alpine all five together to be able to make it down the hill. You're not making turns and moving down the hill with just one. We tried to explain that when Josh played a little bit, remember with if you're just on pivot, well, you can't have pivot without edge, and you can't have you know any steer without a steering component, and you can't be able to have any you have to have a little bit of inclination or angulation or tilt to be able to hold the edge against the hill. So those kind of things all come together whether they're alpine or snowboard, just a little bit different words with it, but they all hold true. And then we had this earlier, 
just for reiteration, is if you wanted to, only for the next couple of weeks, here's the link uh, to our education material. You can get that online. Uh, it's only going to be up for a couple of weeks. It should be able to pull up. Yeah, grab a picture of it if you need to. Right. So that's the one that we just passed that's around. The thing, right? That's the one that you want to use. There's the top one is for, uh, if any, we have some more of these. If you guys would like them, this was our um, Learn Connection Teaching Snow Sports pamphlet that we have that all of our teams brought out here. So it's a little bit about everybody. And then the one that you guys are doing that's going to let you get to all the manuals is this QR code. Okay. And that one's going to allow you to download it and get the manuals. Okay. And if you do have any problems with that at all, um, I'll give you my email. You can contact me and then make sure that we get it in some way, shape, or form. Because I think one of the important things I know that we've learned this week is that you know within this group, people are really willing to share their knowledge and what they and their different concepts. And from that, we're only going to make our students better, and we're going to make better instructors, which has been my goal all along. Because it's it's really neat to see how people are evolving. They're not just out there to be helpful to the disabled population and to give them just a, a, an experience, but they're actually out there to give them, uh, teach them how to ski, teach them how to enjoy the mountain, teach them to explore more than themselves and get, make them be more than maybe they thought they possibly could. And that's a great focus. We're going somewhere with this. So. And it's been a lot of years in the making you know, when you think back, or even with a lot of volunteer programs. And so for a lot of us out there, there's a lot of combinations in their ski schools, right? You have volunteer-based, and then you have paid instructors, and, and that brings up some really different dynamics, too, sometimes between paid and volunteer, right? Anybody have completely paid instructors? Yeah. For adaptive. For adaptive, yeah. So everybody that you have is paid, though. No, so, no, not everybody. We have a combination. Of, of volunteers, yeah. <laughs> So I, and I know that one of the things that I hear sometimes in the U.S. is that because the student or the sometimes the parents can drive the, the lesson in the paid lesson because it could be the, the tip at the end of the day versus, you know what I mean, like saying, well, we wanted to have them up, we want to ski with them on a black slope. We so, <laughs> what's that? No tips in New Zealand. Yeah, so, yeah. but it, well, it's a, it's a, it can be an issue in the United States, so a family comes in, right? and they've come from somewhere, and they're like, well, we want to ski the whole mountain together. But you're like, but I'm, we're trying to work on, you know, making this child independent sort of thing, so that they can, you know, eventually be independent. But like, oh, we want to just go ski. Well, would you do that? In no other ski school do you take a young child out and just take them to the top of the mountain. They still have to learn, right? It's just all of a sudden that some bit of a disability comes into play. Now it's okay to, to give them all the keys to the castle and take them to the top. Well, you really have to reevaluate that sometimes because at the end of all of a sudden that starts to become repetitive time after time. And then they go to a ski school, another one, and somebody's like, no, we don't, we're not going to do that. We're not taking the, and all of a sudden they're the bad guys. So it's it, that consistency and that message of trying to teach and to build upon skills and to advance the way everyone else does. There's, it's not only a lifestyle, but it, it, it really builds them into a stronger individuals and more independent individuals in life. But it's, yeah, we were not all given everything, right? We just happen to have really cool tools that can allow us to do that, but sometimes it can be used in the wrong way. So, yeah, it's just a, a simple message that that's why we drive the independence factor so far. But we all know that there's times where that's not possible at the same time. So, yeah. I hope you guys, that's my soapbox on it that I get on sometimes. So, but I feel it's an important message, and there's all variations of it. But, you know, we have to keep that grounded that, you know, we are really good teachers. We put a lot into it, all of us do. So, and it's evident in our manuals and the educational materials that I've seen that you guys have had on this group, too. So, we're driving it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Thank you guys. It's been a great week. Yeah. yeah. Any questions at all? Comments? Yeah. <laughs> and one of the things in the, that is in there that may be hard for you guys to find is, you know, we talked about it a little bit today, and those adaptive equivalencies yeah. that are on there that were really those great descriptors. If you're interested in those, yeah, please contact me and I can show you how to navigate to get to all those.
<coughs> a way we can actually add it to this at some point. But um, it's just one of those materials that's in you know, there that explains you know what a wedge wedge Christie up through dynamic parallel um, is for all aspects of adaptive three track four track and model lot that we have. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's one of my favorite photos. Uh, is that your daughter? Is that your daughter? That's not my daughter. No, that's that not ours. That was just, uh, just, a, just, a, just a little girl out at Big Sky, Montana. Yeah, yeah. I guess she was enamored with big wheels. <laughs> yeah, that would be cool. Either that or she recognized yeah. what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> that was a great photo. Because she went right up to him. No hesitation. Yeah. But I know you guys would really love those equivalencies. I know they sound very techy when we were reading through them. Today, you know, like a red one off, and we're like, well, that's a lot of purple. But it does give you really something to think about um, and something to build from. So I think to actually sit down and write something out about the movements that are actually happening is really beneficial to us when it comes to adaptive. You know, because so the, there's a lot of just getting out there and doing it and figuring it out and because each person is so different. But if you have kind of some place to at least evolve from, it'll help you out a lot. So I'm glad we're sharing all this stuff, it's great. Is anybody in the midst of creating another manual or a new manual or a yeah, first manual? Great writing and editing and trying. It's a lot of fun, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, 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 it's a lot of fun, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's and it, the work that it took from so many people in our country to get that out, I can't even begin to tell you. Mm -hmm. A lot of different authors, a lot of different people with specialties, with all different levels, the amount of editing behind it, you know, trying to make sure you have the medical pieces right, you know, having doctors review it and things like this. It's, you can really start going down some really dark paths, all of a sudden you can dig a hole. Um, so that's one reason it took so long. And, uh, Is that what Barbara? Barbara's way Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, that's what I'm trying to think. Yeah. Is she still around? Is she still around? Yeah. The yeah. 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 She's still around. She's still around. Angie, the adaptive and male. Yeah. I love the way it was cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've been there for a long time. I mean, when you really think about the adaptive, I mean, the reason you know people in there is because it is a small adaptive yeah. world, right? Even as, you know, we have the whole world in here, but most of us have maybe interacted or seen each other in some capacity somewhere, somehow. And I'm sure there'd be a lot more of those paths crossing now, especially since I was such a successful university. That's pretty psyched about that. Yeah, the future's definitely cool. Snowbike. Yeah, we don't have a snow bike certification. That's great. Some people have thought that, that there's only so many certification paths you can go yeah. down after a while. You know, all of a sudden we're like certifying everything that moves down the mountain. It's going to get crazy, especially in this day and age. It's going to be more and more. You guys, there's not snowboarding, there's not the snow ski certification. Yet, so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like well, you got to draw a line somewhere within it. I think it becomes that. It's a great adaptive tool, but we don't necessarily need to have a, a certification to that tool. It's just that it's a nice knowledge base to know how to work and use it within, within the realm of adaptive, knowing that it's a great tool. And also because it's used for able-bodied folks just as much as it is for adaptive. It just has, happens to have a great adaptive um, need. You know, a lot of amputees, a lot of people go in that direction. I think it's a great piece of equipment. This, if, I'm sorry, I'm just thinking. I had a student the other weekend, I woke up in, I think I said, woke up in Whistler in the, in the Northern Season. Mm -hmm. And we had this guy come and he was using this like grid system, like that lane change sort of idea. Sure. And like I never, he was like, oh, like, I, was, I asked him, like, you know, how do you like to be guided? He was like, oh, this is how I like to be guided. And I was like, that's, that's a cool system. I mean, I, I, that was, that's why I've seen that. Yeah. Well, the, what's great about the grid system and the way that it works is it allows for a ton of freedom, right? Yeah. You know, because keep not, instead of you having to do task command and feel like you're yelling or shouting at the person the whole time where to go, it gives them the freedom to make a few turns in there and you're just letting them know in space where they are. Yeah, it's cool. On the mountain. It was, it was, it was, yeah, and especially in big open places where you've got space, it's a, it's a tremendous way to guide. And the, the thing that's great about it too is that you can combine it with another. So you can go command task back to grid, you know, and as, if, as long as you've discussed that in advance, it's a great way to combine the two types of guiding to give a lot of freedom to a student. How cool is it for them to actually be out there and be able to make their own terms out somebody tell them what to do? That's that's a rarity for them. 
in their lives, yeah. especially on in the mouth environments. So that's it's pretty cool. I, I really love the Greek method. Yeah. yeah, it is one of my favorites. You're not familiar with that? No, it, was, it was, yeah, it was, it was new to me, but it was really yeah, basically just pretty mental. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not that you need a, a ton, you don't need a ton of space to do it, but you just need to really define where the, where the grids are and what the parameters are. But again, it's a nice way to be able to let them make their own size here on the way they have used it before. Yeah. 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 There's so much. Many of those things, and I'm sorry for you guys. I can't wait to get your feedback from it, so please shoot me an email or shoot us and grab us on Facebook or something like that. Let us know uh, what you think, things that uh, things would be added to it, or if you'd love to see a supplement. Um, especially, you know, if you guys are in a smaller country where it's sometimes harder to find um, some of the equipment or maybe access to some of the individuals with certain disabilities that are at a high enough level. It's always that's, that's part of it, too. You know, we had a hard time doing some of these photo shoots. Say, oh, we're going to be at one place and we're going to try to grab everybody who's really good at this, 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 and this. And that's that's difficult yeah. to do. So, you know, in some of the the shots and whatnot, I wouldn't say, you know, they're, they're not perfection. They're actually reality. You know, some of the people aren't putting out 100%, you know, the most precise, like, demo team three tracker. But they're a reality and a good um, indication of kind of what we're looking for or what happens. I like how they're real students as well. Yeah, well, they're, they're people with real disabilities. So I think there's only one in there. We, you know, which was a really difficult one to shoot was four tracking. <laughs> well, yeah. because there's so many variations to it when you think about it, right? I mean, four tracking can be from amputees to yeah. to CP. So how do you really define what what it truly looks like? There is no real. There's a very broad spectrum of what that definition mm -hmm. is. Yeah. You know, it really is. So to portray this is the look of four tracking. I don't think it's fair to do it, and um, I think you could put up, there's a lot of, show a lot of examples, but to say, you know, this is the one thing. So, you know, we ended up using an able-bodied person for that one in particular. Um, but other than that, you know, it, and it's hard to fake the disability. Yeah. You know? But that was the one that we, we had a hard time in really defining what it, what it should look, look like, because, I mean, sometimes it uses a lot of different equipment for tracking and be with tip connectors and a, and a spreader bar and outriggers you know, so you tell, just all these different parts and then, then sometimes they don't have that on there. So those are going to be two completely different looks yeah. you know, to it. And where the rotary mechanisms come from, you know, onwards up, because it, sometimes it's all the way down at the ankle, sometimes it's at the shoulders. So it's in the spinal cord injuries and incomplete stroke victims and yeah, it's all over the place. So that one's, you can shoot. 20, 30 different shots just on four tracking, you know, of the same maneuver, you know, just because of the variety of disabilities. But, yeah. So, Jeff, what is your email? Mine is uh, Jeff, G E O F F, at Jeff Krill, G E O F F, K R I L L, <coughs> dot com. That's pretty easy. Yeah. K R I L L, like the little shrimp. Jeff Krill at Jeff, yeah, Jeff, Jeff, Jeff Krill, yeah. One word. One word, no spaces, yeah. And dot com. Dot com. Cool. And Josh, do you have like the same? Josh. How do you say the last name? Stop 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 uh, and then my last name, S-P-O-E-L-S-T-R-A, so that's J Spolstra, at B-B-M-R dot com. Stands for Big Bear Mountain. B-B-M-R. B-B-M-R. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Mountain Resort dot com. Yeah, it stands for Big Bear Mountain Resort. Southern California. It's like this almost every day. I felt like I was at home. Jeff at jeffgrill.com. How do you get a donate, donate, donate name that's the same as your name? Just pay for a donate. I'm the only one in the world. <laughs> there's no one else. Yeah, like Google. No, there is. There, I've never. There's not another Jeff Krill with a G E O F F. Oh, I yeah, every time you, you Google it, you'll find that there's a doctor out there who um, 
his name is Jeff, and he writes research articles about krill, the little shrimp that like blue whales oh, eat. Yeah, oh, that's exactly. Cool. So that's when you Google Jeff Krill, that's what comes up. It's, uh, or stuff about me. So I'm, I'm kind of like a unique enough name, I guess. Cool. Well, you know it's the end of the day, so uh, feel free yeah. uh, to have anything. I don't think we have anything in here no. afterwards. So no, we can just yeah, yeah. 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 ask a very specific question. Sure. sure. Why sure. have a very specific answer? Yes. Where <laughs> you are assisting a student, uh, like a, you know, in a bicycle dual ski, what's your policy? Is, do, do you have a policy on retention and like the, the retention strategy to your oh, so uh, to the guy in the back. As far as what the, how you adjust, how do, how do we detach? Well, there's a few different ways that are used in the US. You know, we as PSSI, we're just looking for connectivity and safety, but we don't endorse one versus another. Yeah. You know, so some of the ones that are, you'll find um, are, you know, the, the hitch that goes around with the wrist yeah. hitch, and we're asking for it should be on the skin. Yeah, is usually what, we like, is what we like to see because, uh, both. yeah, it's like both wrists, not just one. But then some people use a single tether, Yeah. right? And if you use a single loop, then the, the ask would be that there would be a, uh, some, another way to connect. Climbing so harness. Being a, well, climbing harness, right, exactly, with you know a carabiner or whatnot. The only problem with that one that people have mentioned ever is that if it disconnected one way, it could run through the carabiner and come off. Um, that's not that answer. Or, is, or if it was cut or yeah, something yeah. like that. It would run through. It would run through. That's the only thing with a single tether that there's. And then they're using a climbing harness or a tessier belt for the two bar and the same sort of attachment at the back. So when you're talking about like the retention in the back? For like, for what it's a more assisted lesson, where it's a guided lesson or assisted lesson. Right, yeah. Where, where you mean talking going around the back of the chair? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's, again, that's a program by program yes. basis. Okay, yeah, that's the thing. Mm -hmm. So is there a national thing or is it? There's no, we don't, you know, as PSI, so there's best, best practices, practices in as well as through. Yeah, there's a couple of best practices, but no. Because, yeah. and also it depends upon if there's a safety bar, all yeah. kinds of things start to, what types of lifts you're dealing with. So that's why we don't endorse one way versus another. So, you know, in the exam process, we want to see that that's done. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's really because fun. you never know. As as an instructor, you're going out into the world of where there's all these different lifts and all these different programs. So we want to know that you know how to do those things. So we make it part of the. And how many back straps on the outside? Yeah, exactly. And exactly. the same thing with um, when we're dealing with seizure harnesses and things like yes. that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If we wrote it and we endorsed one, that yeah. makes us liable in the United this States. Is, this is yeah. the thing. Which because we can be sued. You don't do that. You didn't say me using the. Like a safety loop on the chairlift, but you do that at a beginner level for when you're guiding someone. And then, what at what point do you stop doing that? When you're guiding someone. Well, like, sorry, no, sorry, um, if there was a sit ski in your system, do you do you tether to this to the? This is pretty specific. Most places, if it's in a lesson format, they always do it until it until, you until it or it's their own equipment. Okay. And that type of thing, but usually programmatically, most programs that I know. It, the policies that I see out there mostly yeah. are if it's their equipment and they're working with their instructors, they do that. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. Because we were struggling with having this conversation in Australia where like sometimes it causes more problems than you know, agree. at the top, like if you get the agree, because because you're cold, you're getting gloves on and off all the time. Well it's also that you get so comfortable because the person's there yeah, having a chair proficiency. You yeah, to do it. yeah, exactly. You're going over what's going on, then you forget but about no it. one's no one's willing to say like oh it's not necessary. Like I'm not going to say it's not necessary because this is just an accident. Again, it, 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 it becomes you know a, a program by program choice. You yeah. know what I mean, it, if you're feeling comfortable enough, that person's independent, and they're even able to ride the chairlift by themselves. Yeah. Then I think that's where it comes to be. You know, if they can ride a chairlift and they're independent that yeah. way by themselves, I don't think you need that anymore. But if you have an instructor there, I saw so, um, when we were out there, that saw the Bulgarian do I think his name uh, Dino. Zabi. No, that's oh, no, the, oh, oh, yeah. Zabi. Yeah. Zabi. Yeah, he was using the table, and his instructor was, his coach was, um, just kind of holding on to the kid, fine. Like this, and I thought they were going to the top. I'm like, holy shit. You're going to, like, that's from behind the lift, you mean? Like, he was, he was going up, like, stabilizing. Stabilizing, because obviously he was a little beginning, and the mm -hmm. device was challenging. Right. Because he didn't have any kind of attachment, like, to help him. He was, he was just kind of, he was just holding on. Oh, the. The, the skier was holding on. This is the coach behind, like yeah, the skier instructor. Oh, and the I, was, I was like, whoa. 
was holding the liquor. It didn't have any kind of retention. Oh, it was oh, awesome. It's cool to number three. And it's all about the student. And so what kind of terms uh, that are equivalent in that level of um, exam. So you're looking at greens to early blues, blues to uh, easy blacks, uh, on piste mostly, and then uh, and then even like even some blacks in the uh, in the level three. Uh, but we're really looking at uh, what kind of tethering you're able to do and how you can uh, teach to the tethering. Uh, and so not just the tethering, but the guiding, so you can teach it into independence. So there's not just how to safely tether somebody, but there's also how to be able to have a progression through the tether. Uh, you know, so you're not just the guide, but you're also the instructor. And so we do, uh, it, uh, on the tethering side of things, it all comes with a uh, uh, falling leaf. Uh, and so you're on your heel side. Uh, we call it a dynamic falling leaf. Uh, it's kind of fun uh, because you're moving so fast and you're using a lot of separation of the lower and the upper body. And so we have a, I do a full progression and a full uh, <clears throat> event in that way with the instructors just to see if they have their own movements capable uh, before I even put them in tethers and, and then we'll ghost uh, a sit down. I won't put somebody in right away. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah. and that's one thing we're really trying to advocate too is that you know when you teach tethering, whether it's snowboarding or stand up skiing, is that I know I really like to see people use things like firemen dummies. If you know what that is. They're, they're dummies that they use for fire rescue and whatnot. So it's a lot better to use that than putting up your friends and your other instructors. Or if you say there's still not enough weight. Right, exactly. Yeah, so to use something that's sad, but yes. so something that's heavier, yeah, if that's what you have. But we found that the, the fireman dummies, because they're anatomically correct, they're made to look like a human and weigh in the right parts, the head and everything else, they're a little bit sloppier. And they're more difficult than you because they're not going to help you at all right. yeah. getting them centered. But you know, it's it's a great way to really learn how to tether in a really flowing way because you're not a, you're not holding back all the time. And, you know, when you have a real person in there, we tend to be a little more nervous, right? But if you can learn the point of no return, it's you, you're going to become a better tether because you're not when you're afraid that you're going to hurt somebody, you're always holding back just that little bit. You don't really explore what the machine can do. And then people end up being a little too fearful. Next thing you know, they're picking up more speed, or they themselves, as a tether, don't create really good turn shape. And you can learn to get really good turn shape, and especially when we're talking about fixed rigor, um, when you have something <laughs> like that. Because yeah. I always encourage my people on that: take that dummy out, flip it, roll it, yeah. know what it's like, see what it looks like, and figure out what it is. Because sure. then you can take it back from there when you've learned something. You know, if you don't know what it's like to fall or how it's going to fall and how it's going to react. You never really you're yeah. sort of the epitome of what so you can become as a as a tether. So yeah, I, I like that approach in a lot of ways. Was that? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually one of the. I think it's one of the best tools, you know. So there's, and you have to also then look at maybe the way that those skiers who are saying that are tethering. Yeah. There's a lot of um, dangerous tethering going out there that's really about speed and thrill yeah. ride. That it is about developing skills in terms of shape. Yeah. And we've all seen it out there, right? Yeah, go ahead, Tom. Um, you talked about tethering with snowboard. Did you, uh, what, what about bucketing with snowboard? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll yeah, go through again more progression on the rider himself, you go to on the instructor, instructor, because there's definite upper and lower body separation and control and ownership. Uh, so on the snowboard side, it's the same on the ski side, your upper body has to be able to dictate or help or guide the student. Your lower body has to be able to dictate and guide your equipment. And your whole body, plus the equipment and the body of the student, has to be able to have linked good turns. So there's there's three elements going on all at the same time. And the, the level of, of, of ownership and movements are, are at a very high level, even though it's at a low level of an exam standard. And that's just what it has to be. Yeah. So what I like to do is I'll go through all the movements that are needed from the guide, independent of anything, uh, out on the hill by themselves. So I'll go through a whole progression, whether it's in the clinic or even in the exam. And if they don't have that as, as independent writers, 
I won't, I won't even put a list on because I'm like, it's not there. That, that elementary skill isn't even there. Uh, and so then, uh, then we'll go into, once we get to hand assist or bucketing assist, then we'll go do the bicycle. The bicycle is usually the, the easiest and best because of the handlebar in the back. Most models have some sort of handlebar or some sort of handles, and the skis are usually shorter on all the different models of bike skis. Uh, once you get into the model ski, then it becomes a whole other whole other ball. Yeah. Uh, and it is much more difficult. It is. Then when, when you're asking, say, about bucketing, are you using that as just an assist to get kind of from one little point or get across the flat or in an emergency situation? Or are you talking about? And taking somebody for a bucking excursion. I was going to ask that question. Yeah, but at the same time, it, when it's needed, I would say. Yeah. And at some point, it is. Uh, I was uh, a little bit curious when you say that tethering is assess, or, or I would say, yeah, assess and, and, and test it on the black skull. At the same time, I'm. I know how good a snowboarder needs to be to bucket, you know, and, and, and as, if there is any problem on, a, on that black and he needs to bucket, wow, that's going to be a fun, yeah, one, a fun one to watch. Yeah, it is a little bit, you, yes, when you get to that level, we, and, and I'll, I'll pull it up here, is, uh, and I'm going to do it right now, actually. Because, yeah, I was curious about that too. Uh, yeah. So, so I'm going to read this uh, for you, uh, and it's the one in quotes, and this is what was one of the biggest drivers for the new manuals. Over the last few decades, ski instruction for people with disabilities has evolved from just taking people out for a ride to embracing the belief that instructors should actively teach them to ski, capitalizing on each student's abilities and encouraging independence. And we'll see that, and why I brought that up is it directly relates to that really egocentric tether. I am the best tether of this program. Or bucketer. Or I'm the best bucketer of this program. Bucketer. Well, it's... And you're, and you're, and so, guys, fortunately, we, we see... Stop. That's the thing that we... We as educators don't... I'm going to focus this to us. The <laughs> bucketing <laughs> ride, because it, it is a ride. There's no, there is legitimately, there's no teaching. Well, I'm just trying to show them how it feels. Please. All you're showing them is edging this, and there's no teaching yeah, sure. aggression so, to that. Uh, so when when would you need to be tethering someone with black? Or what, like what? Because it, if if you're in a, like if you're yeah. skiing on a black program, I don't, yeah, it just seems like if you're able to ski on a black, uh, yeah, okay. So why? Yeah, why? We don't test tethering on, <laughs> on a on a black, like on, on a very steep black run. Well, I mean, there's the U.S. doesn't have straight blue to black. Yeah. It's very, very different. Uh, but what we look for is to be able to get in and out of, like, say, a hill. Uh, I worked at a one, one mountain that the best green terrain was at the bottom of some blue terrain. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, that's yeah. what it was. Yeah. And so there wasn't as much teaching as I would have loved to, even on the model skis. So I'd come up, we'd get a couple turns, they were effective. They probably weren't the best educational turn that you can make, but they were effective. Terrain. Safely got the student down into the green terrain. Green terrain, boom, there we go, and now they're doing some more. So it's it's more of a of a, of a, of a essential uh, of or, or required uh, if a piece of equipment breaks, uh, and all of a sudden now yes. you, you are the one. That are you about bucketing right now, or tethering? Either one, okay. either one, uh, and uh, it's that's why that's where we're looking at. If it's if we're going into say blue and, and then even even to like black runs, uh, we're not looking for a full run of you being able to either bucket or to, to tell or zip along, is it? Yeah. right? Because it's not it's not it's yeah. not that. So yes, we do we do get into the blues, uh, and uh, I'll back up a little bit is when I'm looking at it from the um, the sit skier was more in that terrain rather than the, the bucket or the, uh, the guide or the tether. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah you're, 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 it's going to be on blue terrain. Because fixed at the higher level, yeah, fixed figures aren't going to be on. No, you can't. I mean, no, yeah. it's not on black terrain. <laughs> right. you know, no, we don't test for that. So. You can almost look at that as being the areas of fun from the 
Kino, as we discussed, from the Kino lecture. This, yeah. yeah. Easy yeah. Fun. Oh, yeah. right. From Easy Fun. Easy Fun. And, and like, Easy Fun is great back. for that experiential one time excursion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to, like, occasionally in Australia, we'll take someone out like, for that, for that out for a ride kind of thing, where they'll come up to the hill and they'll see, like, oh, you guys are teaching people on Sitski, and my, my grandma's like, oh, you know, my dad's in a wheelchair. He's coming up, he didn't even know it was possible. I'm like, okay, well, it's, you, got, you got an hour. Right. You know, but the problem with the excursion is yeah. that now they know one way, and that's the yeah. thought of skiing. And yeah, that's, that is, yeah. You know what I mean? It's the same thing. You know, if you took a five, six year old young boy who's excited to like get out and go skiing, you took him to the top of the mountain and just sent him. Yeah, you know, you know, know what I'm saying? Like, that's awesome. I love skiing. But is he ever going to want to go yeah. back down and like now play you know, out like, and get around? Cars, it's around. really it's hard to take away those exciting moments when you didn't. Go the best, the best student ever told was a um, was a snowboard instructor who broke his back in Fernie and came and he was like, okay, I want to learn how to do it. And I'm like, I'm a snowboard instructor, I don't understand that. And I thought, and we're like, okay, let's do the, let's do a proper progression. Let's take a whole season to do it. And he was, yeah, like that was like three years ago. It was like, oh, this is where we need to be. Like, we need to get those skills early, proper. Like, yeah, and it, it's yeah. tough that you know that excursion versus. Right? Yeah. Because we also see somebody enjoy the sport and, and take advantage of the mountain. Yeah. But it's a, I don't know, sometimes it's a bigger bigger picture thing. Hey, can, sorry, I'm just telling you a big conversation. Um, you just touched on before, like your, the breakdown of your levels. You kind of said, like, well, yeah, how, how do you differentiate between your level one and level three? Oh, you said, like, yeah, green, green, black, essentially? I'm going to go back one second just because we're talking about some, some historical stories, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And I'm going to pick on Jeff. I'm going to make fun of Jeff right now. It scared the living daylights out of me. So it was the first season that him and I were working together in Adaptive. Uh, so him and I were working together on and off for 12 years, 11 years. Uh, but the first term we were together with, I was on the snowboard uh, team and he was on the Adaptive team. And so we worked together in collaboration, but we didn't work together as, as an actual in the Adaptive role uh, with one another. And so I was on the snowboard team and he was in our doing our trainings. So the first year him and I were working together, uh, he got a bunch of work done on his mono, on his bucket, right? And uh, he takes a digger. Early season, middle of October. First run. <laughs> first run, the first day. I mean, full concussion, like both um, both arms arrest because he's going into the fence, broke his ski, uh, a huge digger, right? So that's where the bucket assist came in. Yeah. Right, we're on steep terrain, I did not make it look pretty. His bucket and he, he sucks at bucketing for me. I, 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 because the, it's such a small, tight fit bucket with a long ski. How do I get around the back to do the end around? And so uh, he, he was he was all shook it up. I was shook it up for him. You know, he fully broke his ski, and so it was all. Like, and so you know, we got in, and I just bucketed. Uh, stayed below him in a toe side fallen leaf, and we just did a fallen leaf a few times and got him out of the steeps. And he's like, Okay, okay, I can do this on my own. Was it broken ski? Yeah, yeah. And, and then he skied off uh, enough to, he's a good skier, right? So he was able to get through the, the blue area, and then we got down to the bottom. We did a lot of work, uh, but that's what we're looking for. Uh, to yeah, go back to your that's, question, no, that's, good. that's why we're, we're teaching bucketing at a level two level, and we're saying this isn't to take the structure right. This no. Is, Get out, is, get yeah, it, that's all yes, it is. Yes, it's yes, to yes, like yes, you yes. just want to show a few turns how to safely navigate to bring it down the hill. Yeah. Right? Or to get across the flat, you know, to be able to how to move it and make safe turns. Yeah. That's yeah, re that's really the use the of, of the We're not to yeah. stop. Yes, bucketing yes. Yes. and it's the <laughs> it's my least favorite photo that I see on people's Facebooks and, and in programs around the country is the person holding the handle, high edge angles, yeah. ripping the push out. And it's because it, and the person probably has handheld outriggers even in their hands, or they're just not they're not involving the student. They're just showing them, and it's actually really dangerous for your instructor yeah, because their right. skis are right in behind. They can cross up and get inside. I mean, there's a lot of yeah. safety pieces around that, and it's again, it's we have all this amazing equipment that you can do some pretty cool things with, but we can also use it for harm at the same time. I, I like to compare, we're in a, that era of 
you know, tools are great, right? You have a hammer. You can build a, an incredible house and do all these good things. <laughs> you can also turn the claw around and tear it down. So you can do great work with a hammer, and you can also tear something apart. And it's it's that kind of thing that happens, especially in that bi ski world. It's you have yeah. so much potential to yeah. do great and develop good progressions and get the student involved, but it's so easy to just. I've been thinking about writing this article for a while too. The evils of the hammer. Maybe it's a book. I don't know. But there's, there's a lot of philosophy behind it for for good and for you know it helps the instructor in so many ways. It can be used a lot in a good way in teaching. But then the second it just becomes this crutch to just give a ride, it changes it changes everything. And there's a this I totally first of all I totally agree. It can be really. And we've all seen those like students that. They've come for so many years, and they're like, they're, they're really like low-level function, and they want to get out. And they're like, for that student, like, okay, but you can do so much harm so quickly. Right. But you're not taking on black kids. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. I've, seen, I've seen some stuff around like, oh, yeah. yeah. You know, why don't we just not start the nightmare collection of pictures like that? <laughs> <laughs> We've all seen it right too many times, right? I mean. Nah. Yeah, we should we should just put put them up on a wall like in the post no, office. No, watch shame. it, please don't watch shame. it for the shame. Ah. I, I have some. The wall of shame. <laughs> the wall of shame. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. And I apologize. I did get off track because I wanted to re go back yeah. to that, that question that she had. But somebody asked about the certification, like between one and three. Yeah, just sort of simple. Screen blue black because that kind of kind of for the most part it really is as far as it, where we want to do it. So what you have to do. do yeah, just to be yeah, yeah, level two and level three, you have to be certified in all aspects of adaptive. And yeah. level one, you oh. basically specialize in an area. Of <laughs> and then level two and three to be full cert, you have to be able to do all of the so six so major so it's approach style. Yes. Right. So, yeah. so you have three track, track, four track, mono, five, and the I mean, I'm, yes. Yeah. So you can specialize in, in VI or common or standard sit down uh, in, in a level one. But once you go to the level two, to get your level two, you have to be all aspects of yeah. you know, all major of the disciplines in that. Yeah. Yeah, we just didn't communicate. I didn't like you. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for sticking around. It was a lot longer.